The Quran has a great deal to say about the patriarchs and the prophets sent to previous peoples, especially to the Israelites. But in telling its version of these stories, sometimes the narrative is very similar to the Bible and sometimes it's radically different. And I want to um, explore why this might be the case uh, with the help of this book, The Bible in Arabic, The Scriptures of the People of the Book in the Language of Islam by Sidney H. Griffith, who is Professor in the Department of Semitic and Egyptian Languages and Literatures at the Catholic University of America. This uh, is quite a, a new book um, and uh, it has some rave reviews on the back by leading scholars. For example, from Yale University, it says the Bible in Arabic represents the work of a scholar at the height of his powers. Griffith demonstrates widespread mastery of his subjects. His expertise spans not only Christian Arabic translation and interpretation of the Bible, but also Jewish and Islamic Arabic literature as well. The result is a book that fills a conspicuous gap in our knowledge. It would surely become a standard in the field. That's from Steve Davis, who is a professor at Yale University. So I just want to share with you what Griffith says uh, about this, uh, because I think he has some fascinating uh, ideas. His hypotheses are very compelling, I think, although you, obviously you can disagree about why the stories of Moses and Abraham and David and Job and so on are similar in uh, to what we find in the Bible, and yet sometimes they're different. And what's really going on here? Why is the Quran different from the Bible about these patriarchs and prophets? And Griffith comes up with a plausible uh, view, I think. So I'm just going to read some uh, extracts from chapter two, the Bible in the Arabic Quran, and I'll be making some comments, as always, en route. The Quran is a very is very conscious of the Bible and sometimes presents itself as offering once again a revelation previously sent down in the Torah and the Gospel. One verse even seems to put the Quran on a par with these earlier scriptures when it speaks of the promise of paradise for those who fight in the way of God, as already truthfully recorded in the Torah, the Gospel and the Quran. That's the, the ninth chapter, uh, verse 111. On the other hand, the Quran's text insistently recalls the earlier biblical stories of the patriarchs and prophets, and even appeals to the books of the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel by name. On the other hand, Islamic scripture also pursues a reading of its own, and often noticeably distinct from, and sometimes even contrary to, the biblical understanding of Jews or Christians. For the Quran is in fact very selective in its approach to the Bible and to biblical law, law spelt L-O-R-E. It ignores entirely portions of the scriptures that are very important to Jews and Christians. The New Testament Pauline epistles, that's Paul's letters, are a notable instance of this disinterest. They're, they're completely ignored, as are large portions of the former and later prophets in the Hebrew Bible. What is noticeable is that the Quran is not so much interested in the Bible per se as it is in well-known accounts of the Bible's principal characters. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, David, Solomon, even Job and Jonah, along with Zechariah, John the Baptist, Mary and Jesus, son of Mary. Just to mention the major personalities. It interweaves recollection of the recollections of the stories of these patriarchs and prophets into its own distinctive prophetology. This is a very Griffith word, prophetology, his own understanding of the prophets, the way it presents the prophets. Culminating in Muhammad, the messenger of God and the seal of the prophets in Surah 33 verse 40. And in the presentation of God's message to the community of believers, the prophet has summoned to hear it. The Quran thus appears on the horizon of biblical history as a new paradigm for the reading, figuratively speaking, of a familiar scriptural narrative in an Arabic-speaking milieu, offering a new construal of a familiar salvation history, albeit not without echoes of earlier traditions. So that's uh, Sidney Griffiths setting up the chapter. Um, I, I think he's, he's more or less saying that the, the, the Quran tells these familiar stories of Moses and Abraham and so on in its own way, according to its own understanding 
of prophethood. Um, and there's more to come about this. He continues at the end uh, when he summarizes the chapter, having looked at each of these prophets in turn and what the Quran says and how it differs from the Bible. The quick review of Quranic presentations of biblical patriarchs and prophets just rehearsed, selective and schematic as it is, nevertheless, nevertheless makes three things fairly clear. Biblical personalities in their stories are recalled according to the paradigm of Quranic prophetology and not according to Jewish or Christian narrative patterns. The narratives are sometimes haughtingly close to the biblical versions, but they frequently incorporate non-biblical Jewish or Christian apocryphal and traditional law, L-O-R-E again. And there are almost never any actual quotations from a known biblical text, or for that matter, from any other text. These observations give rise to three preliminary conclusions. The sources of the Quran's biblical and traditional reminiscences are oral. The Quran's recollections of the biblical patriarchs and prophets, according to the paradigm of its own prophetology, bespeaks the Arabic scriptures' corrective, even polemical stance towards Jewish and Christian scriptures and traditional law, L-O-R-E. So what he's saying here is, to put it in simpler English, because it's a very academic book, this is not, not meant for the, the Daily Mail reader or something, um, what he's saying is that the Quran obviously retells these same stories according to its own understanding of prophethood, but it, it does it not just summarising or paraphrasing what's in the Bible, it corrects it. It corrects the biblical stories. It talks about even polemical stance towards Jewish and Christian scriptures. It clearly views these scriptures as distorted, as not speaking the whole truth about Moses, Abraham, David and so on. So this is what the Quran, the Quran is doing. It has, it has this corrective polemical relationship with the previous scriptures. And he continues, and giving the lack of actual quotations from the Bible, the presence of the Bible in the Quran is not textual. In other words, it's not quoting chunks of the Bible. In its own words, in its own words, it is present, but by way of allusion, allusion and representation. So in other words, it retells stories which sound eerily familiar to us if we know the Bible well. On the other hand, they, they sound different as well. But the reason is the Quran is correcting the Bible, the stories, according to Sidney Griffiths here. So um, the last part I want to read um, is uh, the last paragraph of the chapter uh, entitled The Bible Encountered in the Quran. The Bible is both in the Quran and not in the Quran. That is to say, it has virtually no textual presence. He says virtually because arguably there is a single verse from a psalm that is quoted uh, in the Quran. That is to say, it has virtually no textual presence, but the selective presence of an interpreted Bible in Islamic scripture is undeniable. And the selection process involved in the inclusion of biblical reminiscences in the Quran, according to the hypothesis advanced here, is one determined by the Quran's own distinctive prophetology. That is to say, recollections of biblical patriarchs and prophets and references to the earlier scriptures that tell their stories appear as integral components of the Quran's advancement of its own prophetic message. And what is more, the Quran is corrective of and even polemical towards the earlier readings of the scripture people, that's Jews and Christians, to the point that it can even accuse Jews of distorting the scripture of God sent to them. And then he gives some quotes from the Quran. This dimension of the Quran's reprise of the Bible bespeaks the opening of a new book altogether in the growing library of books on the interpreted Bible. Or perhaps it bespeaks not so much a new book as a corrected alternative scripture, one that recalls the Tanakh and the Bible, but ultimately rejects them in the forms in which Jews and Christians actually have them. It is no wonder then that for the latter, for, that for the later Muslim scholars, there was for the most part little interest over the centuries in the Bible 
as the Jews or Christians actually have it, the Quran has made it irrelevant, um, which is very, very interesting. Uh, what my own personal analogy for this, uh, he talks about the this dimension of the Quran's reprise of the Bible bespeaks the opening of a new book, or perhaps it bespeaks not so much a new book as a corrected alternative scripture. What we're looking at, to use a very different analogy, is like you're, you're updating your software from particularly a, 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 a software computer that may have just about worked, but nevertheless was riddled with problems and distortions. And you came along and you replaced it with an AC PC software system. Uh, I'm not mentioning Apple here or my own MacBook Pro, one that doesn't crash, one that's not uh, you know, messed up. And uh, th that's a very sort of crude analogy here. I think uh, the Quran is the pristine replacement for a, a scripture that has been changed and misinterpreted and partially lost or forgotten and so on, although it still retains some of its uh, uh, integrity in that it is speaking of Moses and Abraham and so on. So I think that that would be my own kind of rough reinterpretation of what Griffith is saying. Um, so that, that explains, I think, and I find this personally, I find this plausible. This explains why uh, there are these differences, why uh, the Quran's presentation of Moses uh, as a righteous man is so different from the bloodthirsty killer that is presented in the Bible, someone who commands in the name of God that women and children should be killed. We would not find that in Islam, of course, at all. Finally, um, there's just a little footnote by way of uh, parenthesis here, uh, footnote, footnote 64, about Isa, the name of Isa, which I find fascinating. And he says, of the many explanations for the form of Jesus's name as it appears in the Quran, this Isa, what's, what's the origin? Where is this? Why is it Isa? The most reasonable one from the, this writer's point of view is that it reflects an Arabic speaker's spelling of what he hears in an Arabic articulation of the common Eastern Syria, Syrian form of the name Ishu, I-S-H-O, I-S-H-O. So it's an Arabic understanding of the common Syrian form. And of course, the Syrian form is the Aramaic form as well. So I do recommend uh, this book very much. Uh, it is a heavyweight academic tome. No worse for that. Um, it has rave reviews, as I say, from academics in the field. And I think it plausibly uh, advances the case, which has been believed, I think, by Muslims, most Muslims throughout the centuries, that the the Quran uh, corrects uh, and gives the, the truth about the uh, the stories of the people uh, of the Moses and Abraham, Jesus and so on. And it frees it from the corruptions that um, have crept into these scriptures that Christians and Jews have today. Until next time.